Cabby! Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I feel relieved that everything is settled. The inspector told me that you were not as useful as you had hoped in this case, but you did your best, and I am grateful to you. Dear Lestrade, well, the inspector deliberately minimized my role in this matter so that I could reveal a secret to you. I wish James, I mean, Lieutenant Harrington could be here now, but... He had to leave for London on a very urgent business. But how could you know? It is my business to know, Miss Bromsby. Thus, I am able to tell you about the case of the silver earring. Everything begins on that sad afternoon, which was to celebrate your birthday and ended with the untimely death of your father. Miss Bromsby, you did not murder your father. I kissed your hand that day and did not detect even the slightest smell of gunpowder. I also discovered powder traces that proved the shot was fired from behind the second side door. You were not seen at that door. But where did the murderer go after taking his shot? Everyone who tried to exit through the side entrance found it blocked. According to witnesses and other evidence, none of the guests could have possibly been the murderer because they were all present in the ballroom. No one left through the service door and traces confirm that no one could have fled by using the staircase. The windows in the kitchen, as elsewhere in the manor, were appointed with thick bars, thus they offered no escape. So did he vanish into thin air? In fact, one of the parties did leave the ballroom and went to the kitchen corridor. He left to meet his accomplice who was not an invited guest. This accomplice was a professional actor who was disguised to resemble our missing invitee. This guest hid under voile in the shadow of a statue and waited for his moment. Meanwhile, his twin acted out his part in the ballroom and provided the murderer with a perfect alibi. When the killer heard the applause, he left his hiding place, aimed, took his shot and hit his target. It is important to know that the actor was well placed at the manor. He secured entry to the manor by impersonating a French head waiter. Using his position, he persuaded those in charge to use long tablecloths and to arrange the tables in a most peculiar manner. When the shooting occurred, our actor joined the crowd and rapidly crept across the room, concealed under the tables. As he neared the side door, he rose from beneath the last table and acted as if he had been jostled and fallen. However, as he stood, he accidentally snagged a small piece of his dirty glove upon a chair. When he arrived at the door, which was held closed by the murderer, he tapped on it using a prearranged code and was allowed entry. He exited to the corridor while his partner continued to hold the door shut against all others. The actor discarded his disguise in the deep kitchen well, helped himself to two bottles of excellent whiskey and quietly went outside. The assassin waited several minutes. Then, in the last seconds of the confusion, he returned to the ballroom. Thus, we have the crime committed by an individual whom everyone swears was in the room when the shot was fired. But this agrees with my conclusions. Richard is an actor, and everyone swears that Grimble was in the room. I didn't consider the course of events as you described, Holmes, but admit it, our deductions agree. Moreover, both of these suspects are similar in size and manner. Your theory presumes that Grimble is an excellent shot, which is false. It also takes on faith that Sir Bromsby had discovered the misappropriations, supplying Grimble his motive, but irrefutable proof that neither Grimble nor Richards were guilty waited at Horace Fowlett's, the matter of his pillow. But there was no pillow at Horace Fowlett's. Nevertheless, Mr. Fowlett slept with one. When I arrived at his home, I believed him already dead. Therefore, the news of his hasty departure came as no surprise. From the evidence obtained at his home and the statements of his neighbour, I learned the following. On the evening of his death, Mr. Fowlett was visited by a man who desired to sell him some exotic trifle. While this man distracted Mr. Fowlett, a second man quietly crept into the house and tried to open his safe. This individual was well acquainted with the house and the location of the safe. But when he failed to open it, he most likely became enraged and killed Mr. Fowlett. This individual, Miss Bromsby, was your cousin, Wyatt Collins, who returned to England under the name Johansson. But what about this pillow? 
Mr. Fowlett's pillow had vanished. Later, Dr. Watson discovered a feather from the pillow in the train compartments used by the man who impersonated Fowlett. But why did Fowlett's impersonator take the pillow, and why didn't the station manager notice it? Mr. Fowlett was short, but very portly. In order to imitate him, the man used the pillow to create the appearance of a stouter man. There is no other explanation. This man was a much leaner man than Mr. Fowlett, Mr. Grimble, or Mr. Richards. Then, Holmes, who did murder Sir Bromsby? And for what reason? You'll see, Lestrade, when it's a question of multiple murders, except for the deviant ones, there are two primary motives, revenge and greed. Wyatt Collins' presence at Fowlett's tells us his motive was about Bromsby's wealth. He went there for the express purpose of stealing the will so that he would receive at least a portion of Bromsby's estate. If his uncle had died with no will found, Collins would have been entitled to a share of the inheritance under English law. But if my cousin failed in his attempt and the evidence clears my name, though I am to inherit, why were my father and cousin murdered? Besides, tomorrow I am to announce my engagement and will be married soon. Holmes, hold on. There is a flaw in your reasoning. There is only one key for the door to the cement factory, and Grimble is the only person known to have it. So he must be directly involved in the murder of Johansson. I mean, Collins. Is that true, Lestrade? Mr. Richards told me that there was indeed a second key which was lost. And have you forgotten the murder of the barman hunter? A young man without any criminal record, whose sole interests were painting and flowers. Why was he murdered in cold blood? with no signs of forceful entry or theft at his lodgings. Simply put, he was killed because he was present when your father was murdered. But why Hunter? What did he see or hear? And above all, how did he acquire the earring of Miss Veronica Davenport, the leading actress of the Fairfax Theatre and Dwight Richards' mistress? I can stand this no more. My thoughts are dazed. Will you finally reveal who murdered my father? The murderer? Here he comes now. I understand your feelings of incredulity, but I have never been more serious. You must know that the first person who enters this room is the murderer of your father, Miss Bromsby, and I will provide irrefutable proof of their guilt. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. You made the right choice to leave London. It is unbearably foggy. But Lavinia, darling, what's going on? She knows. But how? I, I mean, what? What does she know? I don't understand. Whatever do you mean? Oh, no. You understand me clearly, Mr. Harrington. And you also, Spencer. Or should I say, Mr. Jeffries? Explain yourself, Mr. Holmes. What a monstrous misunderstanding. Oh, I've just explained myself to Miss Bromsby about the truth of her father's murder. But I can tell the story again from the very beginning. It begins several years ago. Wyatt Collins, the nephew of Mr. Bromsby, is forced by his uncle to leave England for South America. His hatred is fostered by the ingratitude he perceives in Sir Bromsby. Wasn't his uncle's career financed by his mother's money? In Collins' mind, Melvin Bromsby owes him an eternal debt of gratitude and was thus obliged to finance Collins' indolent lifestyle, fulfilling his every need. Here is our first criminal, Wyatt Collins. Then we have you, Mr. Harrington. You were a brilliant student at the Military Academy, and are an excellent shot, are you not? You were the only person at the reception with sufficient skills to make the shot that took Sir Bromsby's life. During my investigation, I learned that ex-officers of Her Majesty's Army enjoy great favour around the world for administrative positions. You left India and made your way to Brazil, where you obtained the position as warden of the prison in Guacayamo. Do not try to deny your presence there. The pictures in your hunting portfolio could have been taken nowhere else in the world except Guacayamo. We now have our second criminal, Lieutenant Harrington. Mr. Jeffries, your arrival in Guacayamo set things in motion. The theatre company had come to Brazil as part of their worldwide tour. You had been involved with the lovely Veronica Davenport and loved her with a passionate yet possessive love. However, Miss Davenport did not share your affections. She had in fact tried several times to end your affair prior to the company's arrival in Guacayamo. 
It seems she was truly devoted to Dwight Richards and would never leave him. After you arrived, you frequented the town's bawdier spots. This is where you first met Mr. Harrington, and you quickly became close companions. It seems tedium and heartbreak do bring certain people together. After the performance, maddened by alcohol and grief, you killed Miss Davenport because she had rejected your love. You then fled to your newfound friend, the Warden, to confess your crime and beg for his help. In a show of friendship, he helped dispose of her corpse and directed suspicions towards your rival, Dwight Richards. Afterwards, you lay low, leaving the others to believe that you had been killed or had gone missing. You stayed hidden until they had departed, and you must have kept Miss Davenport's earring as some morbid souvenir. No doubt you also retained not only the key to the Fairfax Theatre, but the keys from Aston's, where you had been employed several years earlier. Here, then, is our third felon, Mr. Jeffreys. Life was difficult in Brazil for our trio. Mr. Jeffreys rarely went out, Mr. Harrington's men were talking behind his back, and Mr. Collins' funds were inadequate. One evening, Collins spoke of his cousin, who, in a few months' time, was to return to England from finishing school. She was also the sole heir to one of the greatest fortunes in England. Imagine these three men, besotted with alcohol, considering the wealth that would one day pass to this slip of a girl. A terrible plan was devised. Several days later, they left for England, false papers for two of their party in hand, resolved to seize a portion, if not all, of this great inheritance. Incredible! Yes, incredible. And horribly true. At first, their plan was to forge a duplicate will or destroy the original so that Mr. Collins would receive a share of the estate. This would happen soon enough as they would murder Sir Bromsby at his daughter's birthday reception. It was essential that Collins enter the country under false papers so that neither his uncle nor the authorities would be alerted to his presence in England. This would avoid any suspicion attaching him for his uncle's death when he arrived to claim his inheritance. They quickly put their plans into effect. Mr. Jeffreys arrived at the household in the guise of a stylish French head waiter and studied the lay of the manor. Mr. Harrington, the assassin, would accompany a person with rather poor eyesight to the reception so that the illusion of the fake Mr. Harrington would go unchallenged. As the head waiter, Jeffreys was in a unique position to study the guest list. He quickly learned that two of the guests, Miss Roundtree and Colonel Patterson, had both poor eyesight and were unaccompanied. Lieutenant Harrington was quite busy in the days before the reception. He courted Miss Roundtree with great dedication and made fast friends with the Colonel. He hoped to secure one, if not two, invitations to the reception. Your arrival as the Colonel's guest was your first error, Harrington. Is it credible that a young officer who left the army because of his hatred towards all military authority would easily befriend a man who embodies everything that he detests? But your efforts bore fruit and you obtained your invitation. Mr. Jeffreys, as head waiter, took great care that the tables and table clothes were arranged specifically to accommodate their schemes. Mr. Jeffreys then secured the disguise for his role as the false Lieutenant Harrington. He remembered that an officer's uniform, similar to Lieutenant Harrington's, and a red wig, identical to the colouring of the Lieutenant's hair, were in storage at the Fairfax Theatre. He learned that the company had taken up residence at the site of the old Aston Theatre, for which he still had the key. It was therefore a simple matter for him to acquire these items for his masquerade. They now only lacked the will, which Mr. Collins presumed was kept at Flowlet's house. Their plan was to take these papers prior to the murder of Sir Bromsby, so that Flowlet would be unaware of either their presence or substitution until it was too late. But things went badly. Mr. Jeffreys tried to divert Mr. Flowlet, but he must have been alerted by some noise as Collins struggled vainly to open the safe. Upon being discovered, Collins killed Flowlet on the spot. The two conspirators then left the house in such a way that witnesses believed it was Fowlett himself who had left. They would now have to find another way to get hold of the money, because no doubt Sir Bromsby had disinherited Collins in favour of his daughter. They decided to take the money from his daughter, a young, naive and vulnerable young woman. On the day of reception, Mr. Harrington arrived with Jeffreys, disguised as his servant Spencer 
and the Colonel. With the promise of whiskey, Jeffries easily secured the unwitting aid of two fellow servants and assumed a position at the service door. He wagered that he could pinch two or three good bottles of liquor from the kitchen if his companions would cover for him. I have just explained what happened next. After the shooting, he took two bottles of excellent whiskey. Only someone knowledgeable would have taken these two bottles over the others and Mr. Jeffries had been formerly employed at a luxurious hotel in France. Upon his return, he gave an accounting to his fellow servants, did his hair, and left the manor. The promised delivery of the liquor and his frightened look secured the two men's cooperation in providing his alibi. They could not have known his true role in these events. The one problem for the conspirators was the barman, Simon Hunter. He had perfect eyesight, unlike the colonel, and realized that the man who claimed to be near the bar at the time of the murder had in fact lied. He hinted as much to Mr. Harrington and most certainly intended blackmail. As they were short on funds, the accomplices gave him Miss Davenport's earring as collateral and pledged to return with the money he demanded. That night, when Lieutenant Harrington visited us in London, he had just come from Simon Hunter's. Hunter had told Harrington that the earring had been pawned and he would not reveal the name of the shop unless Harrington paid him his money. Mr. Harrington ruthlessly killed Hunter and the earring so precious to Mr. Jeffries was lost. Earlier that morning, Jeffries lured Collins to the cement factory on the pretext of fabricating false evidence against Grimble but they no longer needed Collins to acquire the Bromsby fortune. Mr. Harrington would wed the young heiress, then, after a reasonable time, they would cause her untimely death and they would take it all. So Mr. Jeffries murdered Collins and made sure his body was barely recognizable. If he was identified, it would not affect their plans as they believed leaving the corpse at the cement factory would direct suspicion towards Grimble. When Mr. Harrington came to see us, he learned we were hot on Collins' trail and had traced his movements up to the factory. He assumed he would go there within the hour and left to quickly round up his associates and devise a plan. Jeffries, from his days at the Fairfax Theatre, knew an Asian of questionable talents who had no visible ties with this case and could attack us without drawing suspicion their way. We avoided this attack, and from that moment, I was convinced of Lieutenant Harrington's involvement in the conspiracy. The last elements of proof were revealed at the Vagrant's Camp near the monastery outside of London. Mr. Jeffries had tramped through England in his past and might have thought to hide Collins in the forest near the Richmond's Abbey. The very day that I was there, he tried to destroy all evidence of Collins' murder. Fortunately, he did not manage to destroy everything. It seems Collins, foreseeing his possible death, left a small surprise for his accomplices. It would be easily missed, except by someone who observes all and misses nothing. But this is merely some draft to lull us to sleep, Mr. Holmes. Lavinia, surely you can't believe these mad accusations? They arise from nothing. What proof do you offer for what you say? None. Believe what you will, Mr. Harrington. I will warn you that Mr. Collins left a letter written in his own hand which named yourself and Mr. Jeffries and accused you both of complicity in the murder of his uncle. At this very moment, Inspector Lestrade's men are conducting a search of your rooms. They will find the evidence that when added to the accusations within this letter will prove your guilt beyond all doubt. The Chiripaqui cigarettes, your portfolio, as well as a feather from the pillow which was taken from Horace Fowlett's, these items prove my deductions. I suggest we wait here for their arrival with these proofs, and I assure you our wait will be brief. Bravo, Mr. Holmes. Well done. Accept my apologies, my dear Lavinia. I think under the circumstances it would be best if we postponed our engagement. I'm sorry for your father, but what do you expect? We had to give it our best shot. Where is the earring now? You will tell me where is it? Unless you tell me at once where the earring is, no one will leave this room alive. Don't you understand? You are all going to die! They are all yours, Lestrade. I suggest you return with your agents to London as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Grimble, for literally applying my precepts. Watson, let us escort Miss Bromsby to her rooms. She will need her rest. 
Holmes. Collins never named either Harrington or Jeffreys in his letter. Indeed, Watson, but they could not have known. I played my bluff, and they believed me. And Grimble, where did he appear from? You can now boast that one of the most influential men in England served as your driver. Since my visit to Fowlett's, I knew that Grimble had nothing to do with this crime. I asked him to assist with the investigation, and it was at my request that he took steps to acquire Bromsby Enterprises. He gained us precious time by forcing Harrington and Jeffreys to wait and see if Miss Bromsby would inherit. He ran quite a risk in doing me this favour because their plot then turned against him. I also asked him to send the letter which lured the two murderers away from the hall. I needed a moment to explain everything to Miss Lavinia. It would be dreadful if she fell into the hands of her father's killer. From the beginning, Grimble was concerned only with saving her inheritance. He never once doubted her innocence. Nevertheless, didn't he misappropriate those funds? Indeed, but not for his own profit. It was solely to protect his friend Bromsby. An ex-architect with whom he had quarrelled, a Mr. Waters, had contacted Sir Bromsby before this intrigue began. Waters learned from Captain Bowie that Sir Bromsby had encouraged certain actions against workers hired to build a bridge in India. That project was the bridge over the Kalidasa Abyss. Waters blackmailed Bromsby from afar. Grimble received the letters and considered them to be quite serious. He knew his hot-tempered friend well and preferred to conceal the blackmail attempt for fear of disastrous consequences. So Grimble made regular payments to Waters in exchange for his silence. Unfortunately, Collins discovered the arrangement while he was working at the cement factory and threatened to reveal everything. Grimble could not afford for that to occur. He managed to rid himself of Collins by sending him to Fowlett. Then it was Bromsby's turn to discover the blackmail by sheer accident. He was angered, but before he could decide his next move, Mr. Waters died suddenly and removed all threat. When Grimble learned that Waters had died, he confessed all to Bromsby. He noted that the money paid was a pittance when measured against Bromsby Enterprises and that the same amount could now be applied in other ways. India had enriched them so greatly and Bromsby had been cursed over the harm done to the Indian people in his employment. It was decided that these same funds would now be sent on a monthly basis to a Bombay orphanage in the care of a Sergeant Brahamai. It is possible that Bromsby intended to increase his patronage, and this was the important news he intended to reveal to the press at his daughter's reception. It was she who had harshly reproached him regarding his behaviour towards the Indians in his employ. Do you remember the words from that poem which he had written into his notes? It said that the ungrateful always die miserably. Indeed, Holmes. But there is one thing that I still don't understand. Why did you ask Lestrade to put Richards behind bars? He wasn't guilty of any crime, but you treated him as a murderer. I advised Lestrade that it would be prudent to place Richards in custody so we could protect him from harm. Mr. Richards is a wise and intelligent man. He would have recognized Harrington and Jeffreys on sight. When he realized that Jeffreys was alive and that I possessed the missing earring, he would have drawn the same conclusions as I. So this investigation would have been stopped killed by one or two more murders. I see. Well, Watson, you seem to know everything. Tell me, please, that small missive which I can see on the desk. It contains two invitations to the opera's opening night, does it not? If so, we shall finally have our opportunity to hear this marvellous soprano. Well, what do you say, Watson? <laughs>